and gentlemen all, welcome to this important forum on Walter Rodney, reflections on Walter Rodney. And today is actually the anniversary day of the student protest, October 16th. And we're looking at Rodney, Black Power, and Rastafari. And I would like to particularly acknowledge Walter's classmates who are here, people like Erna Broadbow, Brenda Skeffrey, there may be other classmates that I don't know, but I know of those two. And to welcome all of those who participated in the road march, let's call it that. Those of us who were tear gassed and those like me who escaped into a passing car in Ligony. So this 50th anniversary commemoration is a very important moment for the University of the West Indies because it marks our history of social engagement. It's unfortunate that the university administration didn't find a way to negotiate with the JLP government of the time to not deport um, Walter Rodney. Perhaps they did try, but um, you know, I think perhaps the university might have played a larger role and I want to acknowledge on that score the presence of our Vice Chancellor, Hillary Beckles. I know if it were in Hillary's time, Rodney would not have been deported. <laughs> I, I dare say that. Okay, so as you can imagine, several departments have collaborated for this evening. And so we're going to have greetings brought from Dr. Orville Taylor, head of the Department of Sociology, psychology and social work which is a primary sponsor of this event and after he speaks i haven't seen dr hutton as yet and dr professor shepherd is caught in traffic so she will speak when she arrives if um professor hutton doesn't show up after dr taylor speaks we'll have the next um greetings from Ms. indira prasad the Honorary Council of Guyana. So please welcome Dr. Orville Taylor, Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, the head. Your Excellency, Vice Chancellor, other distinguished persons in the audience who are too numerous for me to attempt to enumerate or to identify person by person. May I tell you just how humbled I am to be here. As a matter of fact, I don't think that I'm worthy to be standing on this podium. But since I'm thrust into this role, let me grasp the opportunity. My role is supposed to be carrying greetings. But I'm carrying a little bit more than greetings. I'm carrying what we say in Jamaica, feelings. And I'm carrying feelings because, one, it's a feeling of great honor and gratitude to be having a discussion about one of the greatest minds to have come from out of the Anglophone Caribbean. As a matter of fact, to have come from out of the black world, period. At a time when we are having conversations about reparations and repatriation, and some of us um, are schooling world systems theory and development theory and underdevelopment theory, etc. My position since I was an undergrad student, and I opened that book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, it's many years ago. My position was, is, and will always be that there is an eternal debt that is owed to people of the African diaspora and Africa in particular. I made no bones about it. Coming out of the Anglophone Caribbean, I say this on air, I say this in my classes, I say it in my newspaper columns, that if you want to have a good understanding, or as Rastafari I would say, overstanding of how we got here and where we are supposed to go, pay a little bit of attention to the seminal work, of course, how Europe already developed Africa, but also how um, capitalism and slavery by Eric Williams. But you know, I'm a sociologist. Of that, I'm also unapologetic. And as a sociologist, one of the things that we have learned to do is to see relationships. So I, while I hug up Walter Rodney 
it, as a Caribbean man, because I'm a CARICOM man, and I'm sorry that I wasn't here because I would have CARICOM 50 years ago myself and defied the government. I am totally unapologetic about the kind of relationships that exist. The seed which was sown by Marcus Garvey. I came to realize later that Garvey's Pan-Africanism, his global outlook, it influenced Eric Williams. I didn't even understand until much later that Arthur Lewis, the icon of the university, Arthur Lewis was a little boy who was taken with his father to these um, UNIA rallies. So guess what? It is all coming together. I want to take the opportunity. I haven't heard it um, said very explicitly, but you know, because I'm Jamaican, I'm a citizen of this country, and I therefore take collective responsibility for the travesty that took place 50 years ago, where this great, Jama great West Indian, I'm claiming him almost as Jamaican, this great West Indian wanted to have come back to his job at this university, and he was barred. And so I apologize to everybody who was affected. I wasn't part of it, but because I'm Jamaican, I'm part of this. You know, just like reparations, you might not have benefited from it then, right? but you, because you are now sitting in the seat, you have to take the opportunity. So I'm apologizing without any apology whatsoever. <laughs> Having said that, isn't it a wonderful occasion for us to be here to put together some of the greatest minds. And I'm very happy to be sitting in, this, sitting in the position of being head of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, as we come together with so many other departments. But guess what? This University of the West Indies, the Faculty of Social Sciences, the Center of Reparation Studies, we are still much too small and as entity to embrace the greatness of Walter Rodney. So like the blind men with the elephant, we take a little piece while we try to build a larger understanding and scholarship. So let's pay attention a little bit and we will learn some more. And let us make sure that we make none of the mistakes that were made 50 years ago. God bless you. So we'll now move on to Ms. Indira Prasad. She's the Honorary Consul of Guyana in Jamaica and we welcome you to bring greetings. Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, professors, Carolyn Cooper, academics, lecturers, <clears throat> members of the diplomatic and consular corps, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank the planning committee of the Rodney Forum for inviting me here this evening to bring greetings on behalf of Guyana. Two years ago, Professor Sir Hillary, in outlining his vision as the new VC for UE, encouraged a rekindling of scholar activ activism. As I see it, scholar activism requires of the scholar to constantly review his or her praxis or practical approach to tackling the pressing issues of today. Naturally, this process of review entails deepening our understanding of the activism of intellectual giants such as Walter Rodney. Crucially, however, having reviewed and wrestled with his or her own praxis, the scholar activists must arrive at new notions for changing and by extension for improving how he or she practically goes about improving the welfare of all. This evening, the Department of Government, sorry, the Department of Sociology, Social Work and Psychology, Department of Government and the Center for Reparations Research, all parts of the UE body should be applauded for their efforts to keep the light of scholar activism burning. So I speak of Rodney, the scholar activist. Rodney was from my homeland, 
Guyana, as you know, and he was born on March 23, 1942. He attended the prestigious Queen's College and won an open scholarship to attend what was then the University College of the West Indies. He graduated with a first class honors degree in history. And from, and from what had become the independent University of the West Indies, Rodney then went on to the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he received his PhD with honors at the tender age of 24. His thesis was titled, A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, 1545 to 1800. In January 1968, 50 years ago, Rodney returned to the UE as a lecturer in African history. While Rodney's activism was, was surely started during his student years, it was his post-doctoral study activism for which he's much remembered. What I wish to underscore at this point is that Rodney, the scholar activist, sought to improve the welfare of those around him in whatever space he dwelled in, broadening and deepening the historical knowledge of people within and without the academy was a central aspect of his praxis. To give but one example of Rodney's broad-based activism, Rodney wrote two children's books during his activist years in Guyana, Coffee Badu out of Africa and Lakshmi out of India. Therefore, while Rodney's activism fits nicely into the pan-Africanist work mold, Rodney's activism was larger and flexible in, his, in the space and time which defines said activism. In short, Rodney was willing and exceptionally able to use his scholarship to improve the well-being of the oppressed, whoever, whomever they might be. So what can we do to rekindle the activism, the activist tradition? This evening, as we listen to the many stories of Rodney's activism, let's ponder on a few questions. Who are the oppressed in today's society and what are their most pressing needs? What are our most pressing needs? Secondly, how can we students, faculty, members of the wider society, improve the welfare of the oppressed amongst us. Improving the welfare of the oppressed is about improving our welfare. In closing, I wish to highlight a framework within which we can rekindle the activist tradition. The United Nations Development Program provides set framework in its sustainable development goals. The goals focus on eradication of poverty, education, gender issues, social justice, and peace, partnership, and the environment. Compared to its predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals, the SDGs place increased emphasis on our natural environment. Rodney, in his seminal work, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, repeatedly underscored the importance of our natural environment and our understanding, mastery, and treatment of it in improving our welfare. Allow me to quote two excerpts from the said book. The first quote, a society develops economically as it as its members increase jointly their capacity for dealing with the environment. This capacity for dealing with the environment is dependent on the extent to which they understand the laws of nature, that is science, on the extent to which they put that understanding into practice by devising tools, technology, and on the manner in which work is organized. The second quote, development cannot be seen purely as an economic affair. 
but rather as an overall social process which is dependent upon the outcome of man's efforts to deal with his natural environment. I wish to thank you for affording me the opportunity to bring these brief remarks, and I look forward to a rewarding evening of discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks, Ms. Prasad. And I now see that Professor Hutton is here, so I invite him to bring his greetings, stroke remarks. Good evening. So I'm bringing greetings from the Department of Government. Um, government, Department of Government supports this commemorative event for Walter Rodney, who was a lecturer here, student before, then lecturer, who has cut a path for the university, cut a path for scholars uh, to suggest that our place is here but our place is also in communities, in the public space. And he was noted for that. And in a sense, he learned some of that when he was a student here. Uh, but I want to put what is going to be discussed this evening in some context. Context being Jamaica, became an independent nation in 1962. And generally speaking, most of the nations of Africa, almost most, Africa and the Caribbean became independent states in the 1960s. But very soon, after independence, Jamaica experienced its first crisis. Certainly, the role of government, first and foremost, was to clean up the colonial mess, the slavery mess. the mess brought about by history. But to do it by ignoring the history and the historical basis for the mess. To do it by forgetting the historical basis for the mess. And so what began was a history of, to a great degree, of silence. Silence in slavery, silence in colonialism, silence in the psychology, the philosophy, the ideology, and the cultures of slavery and colonialism. One of the first things that happened was to really get rid of that signal of this, was the getting rid of Emancipation Day holiday. And part of getting rid of the Emancipation Day holiday in Jamaica was based on the belief that we should really forget that history. And that forgetting that history would be best for us. And it was replaced with a slogan or a motto called out of many one people. Because to celebrate emancipation 
is to leave out other Jamaicans. That was the logic of it. Other Jamaicans who did not experience slavery. And therefore, it would be divisive to do so. But by within eight months, April of 1963, we have Carroll Gardens. That same year, we had the destruction of the greater portion of Bacawal. Then, We have, in 1965, what is sometimes called the Chinese or the anti-Chinese riots. We have the banning of books, including one called Black Beauty, a book about a black horse. Because apparently, to say that black is beautiful, to articulate that, or to embrace that, seemed to be subversive. And this kind of thinking guided 1963, guided Carroll Gardens, guided Bacawal. In 1966 was a very serious year. The rest of Bacawal was destroyed and Shanty Town. 3,000 people made homeless. With popular support. 1966 also, we had the killings of some political activists from three gangs, Spangler, Vikings, and Phoenix, otherwise called Toughest, Rudolph Lewis, was killed. He's probably better known as Zaki the High Priest. Also killed was Douglas Campbell, better known as Tuko Keith. And Kenneth Green, better known as Rashi. It's important because by then the building of Garrison was set in train. It's important to note that, with all the consequences after. It was Zaki's gang that was transformed into the Shower Posse. Then 1966, there was a state of emergency. So that all the things that we can link together, the philosophy of colonialism, which is long tradition in our people, became the basis for articulating or guiding political action and for guiding the shaping of the post-colonial state. But all of these were taking place with the African liberation movement all across Africa taking place, yeah, taking place 
and the civil rights movement in the United States. It is within this context that Walter Rodney was deemed dangerous to Jamaica. First of all, according to persons who, who got rid of him, it would be dangerous for the, for the, the tourist industry. as the Rastas in Montego Bay were also dangerous for the tourist industry. And so we can see, when we look at the music and what was articulated in the music, was a direct opposite to government policy. And that's the context in which um, the Rodney affairs developed. So, um, from the Department of Government, we wish we have good deliberation today and some good discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Houghton. I'm sorry I had to give you a little touch there, but you know Clinton could give you a whole lecture tonight. So. And we have a panel of exciting speakers as well. So thank you, Clinton, for being receptive to the touch. Now, we have um, on the program Ravin Singh, president of the Guyana Students Association of Jamaica. Unfortunately, Ravin can't be here, but he's going to be well represented, and I'm sure she's going to speak in her own right, Ms. Joshanna Hopkinson. Welcome. Sir Hilary Beckles, Ms. Indira Basad, distinguished guests, students, good evening. As was said before, my name is Joshanna Hopkinson. I'm speaking on behalf of the Guyana Students Association, also known as GAISAJ. Now, GAISAJ was revived during the academic year 2017-2018 to cater to the needs of the growing Guyanese student population on the University of the West Indies Mona campus. Now, its main objectives are to create a space at UE for Guyanese students to connect and to network, to provide support and assistance to Guyanese students, but primarily to promote the culture and diversity of my beautiful Guyana to the greater Caribbean and the rest of the world. Now, as, a, now as an association, Guy Saj ho also hopes to pay homage to those Guyanese leaders before it, who made significant contributions to the UE space and the larger Jamaican environment. Now, Walter Rodney is one such personality. He was a student at the UE whose contributions to Jamaican society and politics were invaluable. His academic influence, particularly in his book, How Europe, Undeveloped, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, a book that I had to read for a cape at history, um, as well as his commitment to activism have, has distinguished him as one of the most prominent intellectuals in the region's history, whose legacy continues to live on. It is this commitment to activism and academic excellence that the students of Gaisaj endeavor to emulate in their contributions to the university as well as the greater Caribbean region. Thank you. A plus, Miss Hopkinson, for content and brevity. I will use the privilege of the moderator to tell you about an experience some of us had, Professor Mervyn Morris and I, exploring your beautiful Guyana. We went on a trip to Kaichur Falls. And as we approached the falls, the pilot told us that the landing gear was not coming down. <laughs> and I was sitting at the window. He instructed me to hit the side of the plane to see if the landing gear would come down. <laughs> Professor Morris turned white. I, <laughs> I dutifully hit the landing, the side of the plane. The landing gear did not come down. And we went back to Georgetown, where miraculously the plane landed without any hitting. Now, a Guyanese woman and her daughter who were on the flight that come from New York said, I can't do the Guyanese, but she said that is because they never want to stop why they tell us about landing gear problems. <laughs> well, I can tell you that I got a refund of my expensive flight.
because I never got to catch her. Mervyn was so happy to be alive. I think he forfeited, he forfeited a refund. When I told him I was going for the refund, he said, Carolyn, I'm so glad I'm alive. <laughs> or words to that effect. Not true, Mervyn, or it's untrue to telling on you. I'm just telling a story for effect, but that, that was the feeling. All right, is Professor Shepard here? No? Yes, welcome, Prof. Please bring your greetings, which I'm sure will be greetings. <laughs> Vice Chancellor, Lady Beckles, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the panel, Madam Chair, friends and colleagues all, a very good evening to you. I also want to say honor to the ancestors who are buried on this plantation. Because of their activism, their bawling out for freedom, we are here today. And I give thanks. The Center for Reparation Research is very pleased to be partnering with the Department of Government and, of course, my friend Michael Barnett would not allow me to say no to the approach to partner also with the Department of Psychology, Sociology, and Social Work. I'm sure I'm getting it in the wrong order. Right. But this is our mission, to partner with like-minded organizations and departments to bring knowledge to all those who need this knowledge. A lot of you have this knowledge already, but all of us can learn as we go through. And the Center for Reparation Research, though a fledgling center, is a powerful center. It was launched last year, October. So this is our anniversary. And what better way to spend this anniversary than to be here with you in a ceremony, which is how I like to put it, to commemorate the life of Walter Rodney, someone whose life I've always admired I actually wanted to follow in his footsteps, and I did apply to SOAS in London to do my PhD. But when I took a look at my two little babies, I thought I couldn't leave them. So PhD, later. Children first. And so his powerful book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, is a testimony and a book that provides the rationale for why we are pressing for reparation. So the center is both activist and research-based. And I invite you to come across to the regional headquarters to the center and to see what we're doing over there. We, as historians, have followed, I think, in the footsteps of Walter Rodney. We are rewriting the colonial history, or at least finding balance to the story that we were told about ourselves. We're also engaging in advocacy. We're out there in the schools, in the colleges, on, in the media. Because reparatory justice has to be one way of implementing Walter Rodney's vision for our world. So I'm very pleased to be here. The center is very pleased to be partnering with this sponsor, other sponsors. And we look forward to more of these events and to partner with other departments on the campus and within the wider university. Because our mission is to look to the past, to understand our present, to strategize for the future. But part of that strategizing for the future has to be repertory justice. Somebody must take responsibility for what happened to our ancestors, and we are here to tell them so. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Professor Shepard. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Barnett, the conceptualizer of this forum. I'm sure he will tell you why he decided to do it. He's a member of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, a senior lecturer. 
He's also a member of the um, Jamaica National Council on Reparations. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Carolyn. And um, greetings, distinguished guests. I'm very glad to be here on this auspicious occasion. Um, there are too many distinguished people for me to give everybody a separate um, salutation. So just, I just say all protocol observed. And I'm glad to see the Vice Chancellor here, though, who heads up the Commission of Reparations, the CARICOM Commission of Reparations. What I would say is, is that um, I think it was a, both a calling of the ancestors and you just intuitively, it seemed that Walter Rodney being such an outstanding freedom fighter, such an outstanding um, activist, you know, you, you can't celebrate him too much. There are other events taking place later on in the week to honor his work and to honor his memory and so forth. But this particular forum has eyewitness accounts, which I see as very important. I am a believer in the griot tradition, the African griot tradition. And I acknowledge and I respect the history that the elders have and what I call first-hand testimonials. This is very important. And if it's nothing else, I think this forum will give us a rich sense of that space 50 years ago. You know, people who lived the experience, who breathed it, who smelt it, who, who, who lived, is very, very important. Um, it's something that cannot be underestimated. Sometimes we want to throw history away and say, let's just focus on the present. But Walter Rodney told us how taught us how important history was, you, and particularly African history, especially for people of African ancestry. And very interestingly enough, although some people see him more as a Marxist, he was very racially conscious at the same time. And importantly, he saw, well, he defined black in his conception of the black power movement, included East Indians as well as African, people of African descent. Now, some East Indians embraced this notion, some did not, but he, his vision was to unite the Guyanese population, the Indian and the black population, and the same in Trinidad. As I said, you know, the vision was embraced by some, but not by all. But nonetheless, the sentiment was there. And what he did in 1968 to galvanize the Rastafari movement and the Black Power movement, Black Power groups in general cannot be underestimated. And our panelists will speak to this. Not only his charisma, but his, just his giving nature. You know, he spoke outside the, the, the walls, the ivory towers, so to speak. Some people may consider you. So not only did he conscientize the student population at UE, he also conscientized the black masses outside, in the gully side. He grounded with the brethren, the Rastafari. He grounded with black power groups, a Jerry Small can attest to, and so forth. So he was no ordinary intellectual or academic. He was an outstanding person with a great human compassion a passion for his fellow people, um, the, under the suppressed masses, the have-nots. He had genuine compassion for them. And also he was an advocate for reparation. And I must just say that I'm very happy that the Center for Reparation Research came on board with this because I see, although it's not spoken too much, but if you read Groundings with my brother, and I'm happy I Nation here is, is here with his books because we couldn't have a Walter Rodney forum without the books. And he has some Walter Rodney books. Unfortunately, a lot of them are out of print. Um, Prof. Rupert Lewis wrote a book on the political and intellectual thought of Walter Rodney. You know, I've read it and it's a great, great um, source of information on Walter Rodney. Unfortunately, it's out of print. You know, so, you know, these pieces of information that we can, can gather on Walter Rodney. Let's do the best we can. Groundings of My Brother is one that really I hold close to my chest because it speaks to this experience in Jamaica. Him firsthand, how he felt about being 
banned from Jamaica when he tried to, he came from a black writers conference in um, 15th of October 1968. The following day, the 16th of October then, the riots occurred, um, you know, disappointingly so. But the idea was a protest and, 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 and our panel will speak to the, the, the sentiment, the plan for the, the, the riots, I mean for the protest, and how it became a riot. But I want us to remember that if he didn't affect so many people, if, if, if the emotive, the passion and the love wasn't there for Walter Rodney, there wouldn't have been a student protest from you. I mean, how many student protests have we had in the life history of this, this institution? Let's think about that. That's something else to reflect on. But here we are 50 years ago, 50 years from 1968 to the day. And I think it's just fitting that we have something like this to honor the occasion. Very fitting. And the last thing I will say is that Rastafari Rastafari benefited from Walter Rodney being here. And Walter Rodney benefited from grounding with the Rastafari in 68 and with the other black power movements, the coalescing of energies, the synergy of that unique time in history brought together something so powerful, I would put it to you, that the government felt forced to, clear, to, to declare Walter Rodney persona non grata because they saw the imminent danger of that power of energy that he would unleash potentially or that the, the, the population could unleash the society. Those words I give thanks. Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn as well has a, well, she could say a lot about her personal experience at the time, but you know, that's why she's a moderator. That's no, no accident. Give thanks. Thank you, Michael. If any lecturer were detained and banned, no, all the students would ask is, so who going to take over the course? <laughs> That's just about where we are now in the 21st century. I don't know what we're going to do to change things, but that's the reality. Michael mentioned other events this week. Tomorrow is going to be the annual Walter Rodney Lecture that's put on by the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Professor Brian Meeks will be doing that at 6 in the Neville Hall Lecture Theater. On Thursday, there's the opening of the conference put on by the Department of History and Archaeology. There's going to be an exhibition at the um, regional headquarters at the museum. And then on Friday and Saturday, there's going to be the continuation of the conference in N1. Now, Dr. Barnett is a relentless organizer of events, so I must let you know that on Friday, He's organizing the annual Peter Tosh Symposium, which takes place in the Interfaculty Lecture Theater at 6. So if you have the stamina, there is going to be in, you know, engaging intellectual um, programs for the entire week. So now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the poetry readings. And I take full responsibility for having this item on the program, because I felt we needed to hear from the poets who have done their tributes to Rodney. One of them, decidedly ironic. I will leave you to figure out which one. So we're going to have Professor Emeritus Edward Ball, distinguished literary critic and poet, followed by Professor Emeritus Mervyn Morris, also distinguished literary critic and poet, and bringing up the rare, but certainly not any less powerful than the men, and she's just trying to shake her head like she don't believe me, is Dr. Velma Poet Pollard, you're calling her <laughs> Velma Poet, Dr. Velma Pollard, um, award-winning novelist and poet, and in this context, she's probably best known as the author of Dread Talk, about the language of Rastafari. So without further introduction, Mervyn, Eddie first, then Mervyn, then Velma. Thank you. This morning, this morning, I ran into a friend who asked me if I'd be coming to this function this evening. I said I'd have to come anyway because I'd been persuaded to read a poem at which she opened her eyes wide and said, I didn't know you had a Rodney poem. <laughs> My reply, smilingly, 
it's a Rodney poem by virtue of the fact that it's not a Rodney poem. <laughs> the title is The Poet Bemused. Yesterday, I put on my antique disposition, but it wasn't any use. It didn't at all amuse her ladyship. I fear she's making plans to leave me. So I shall return to the mode taciturn, the man of few words, proverbially unspeaking. They'll whisper, he's deep, that one. But only her gone ladyship carries the secret. He really had nothing to say about important topics like poverty and politics. Why? As you'll note, he never even wrote a Rodney poem. Can you blame me for leaving the creek? My Rodney poem for Eddie Bow and in memory of Walter. One, he lived a simple life. He was a man who cared when anybody hurt, not just the wretched of the earth. He dared to be involved in nurturing upheavals. Two, frustrated by the host of evils, he seemed to me a good man reaching for the moon. He died too soon. Ladies and gentlemen, mine is an after Rodney poem. It's called Black Friday. And I think I was really writing to the government of the time when Rodney died in his homeland. Do you not fear who sent his ashes on the wind that ashes blow more wild than words? Do you not fear who blasted out his fertile source that scattered seed will like the sores grow? Does not the phoenix image fright thee, scholar mind, and walls of Walters threaten nightmares to your bed? Do you not, father, fear who left his young ones fatherless, the future of your fathered young? stung with the poison of their latent rage. Pray to the gods to intercept their hands and know your children guiltless then and free. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie, Mervyn, and Velma for these poems. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we'll have Professor Emeritus Rupert Lewis, author of Walter Rodney, 1968 Revisited, which was first published in 1994 in the Journal of Social and Economic Studies, and it was reproduced by the Cano imprint of the UE Press. And Michael has already mentioned his important work, Walter Rodney's Intellectual and Political Thought, simultaneously published by the UE Press and Wayne State University Press in 1998. These need to come back into print, Rupert, you need to talk, talk to them, okay? And Rupert is, as you know, one of the foremost Garvey scholars and his work on Rodney is a continuation of that trajectory of black intellectual thought. Our second presenter will be Sister Bonnie Heron, who I describe as a Rastafari cultural activist She's a member of the Motherland Promotions of the 12 Tribes of Israel. She's an advocate for the Jamaican Rastafarian Development Community School in Shashamana, Ethiopia. And I think it's important to say that she was the person who brought to the attention of several of us recently that the program for the, the conference for the history and archaeology, the program for that conference, has a fascinating flyer with all male students. The female students who took part in the um, demonstration, they have been completely erased. It's an unfortunate image, but um, Sister Bonnie Heron perceptively brought that to our attention. 
Then we're going to have Mr. Arnold Bertram. He is the author of PJ Patterson, A Mission to Perform, among other, you know, he's a, you know, he's a noted columnist, former member of government. Welcome, you know, Mr. Bertram. And finally, we'll have Bongo Jerry Small, poet, cultural activist. He was a folk philosophy fellow on the campus in 2000. He has been writing a history of his interaction with the university, which is not just about himself, but a larger cultural history. I'm hoping it will be published soon, Jerry. We have to get that moving again. So we're in for a very good discussion now. So first then, Rupert, we ask the speakers to keep to about 15, 20 minutes. It will be more difficult for some than for others. I asked, um, I asked Michael to get a timekeeper. I see no evidence of a timekeeper. But I will be keeping time, and I will be drawing down the people. I are inviting you to say $100 to take him down, or take her down, as the case may be. But I'm trying to respect the fact that these eyewitnesses have very powerful stories to tell, but I know that there are people in the audience who are going to want to chat too, so I'm trying to, you know, keep order. So please welcome Rupert. Thank you very much, Carolyn Chair, Vice Chancellor, Mrs. Beckles, colleagues, friends, old timers from 1968, all many of whom I see around me, uh, young people I also see, uh, not as many, but welcome. Uh, they're doing exams, yeah. Uh, I have set my thing for the 15 minutes, Carolyn, so it will go off. Um, the richness of this audience as I look around uh, merits some comment because um, there are people here who were involved not only in 1968, but the consequences of 1968 for Jamaican politics, for the Grenadian Revolution, for the movement in Trinidad 1970, and so on. I just want to share some of my experiences that can be shared about 1968. <laughs> Uh, not all political experiences can be shared, even at this late stage of life. I write something and give it to Maureen so when I pass on, I can say this is an addendum to what I have to say tonight. And this applies to many people here uh, tonight, what they can say and what they can say even after a long period of time. But I really want to conclude with gratitude to the University of the West Indies for my education. And what I want to also say is that to draw a conclusion, and one of the things that 68 enabled was the coming together of all our colleagues in all the faculties after the government circled the campus. We were forced to know each other. We were forced to know the physicists, the mathematicians, the people in medicine, uh, everybody, because we are all kind of caught in a, an arrangement which, with respect to the question as to what was the university about. And those who are contemplating radicalism, Probably one of the most important issues is the skill sets and capabilities and issues which arise in all the departments. Physics, climate change, people doing social entrepreneurship. One of the things that the left brought about was the optimal use of these skills. And I see Richard Jacobs here who was ambassador of Grenada to the Cuba and to the then Soviet Union. And within weeks of the Grenada Revolution, he was able to organize over 60 experts from St. Augustine who went into Grenada. So I'm just informing you that 
to do the transformational work and to do outreach. This campus and all the other campuses contain skills that you wouldn't dream of. If you stay in your silos in a department, you're not going to be able to, to, to really garner that support. That's one of the lessons I've learned from 1968. Rodney came into a pre-existing situation. He didn't create much that was new, but he added quality to his intervention. There was a black power group on the campus, the University of West Indies, formed in 1967, and the pamphlet had um, four objectives. To create an awareness of what it means to be black, to mobilize and unify black people to act in their own interests, to reject white cultural imperialism, to seek to ensure the rule of blacks in a black society. Among those associated in 1967 with this group were Peter Phillips, Garth White, Keith Noel, Trinidad and Tobago, based in Irving Hall, from Chancellor Hall, myself, Bernard Marshall, Arnold Bertram, Edwin Jones, from Mary C. Cole Hall, Jackie Vernon, Maureen Stevenson, Guyana, Wick Williams, who Jerry Small reminded us at a seminar I did in sociology last week uh, of his brilliant novel, Eichel to Ross, a whole section of it deals with the 68 Rebellion. And that novel won a Cassilis America Prize. From Taylor Hall, Marva Henry, and John Dowie. A subset of this group included Peter Phillips, Jerry Small, Garth White, and the late Minion Phillips. And we were all then late teenage, early 20s. So it was a network, particularly this subgroup, that really had linkages in the urban communities, West Kingston, Central Kingston, East Kingston. I'm sure Jerry will uh, speak to this. And Susan uh, Francis Brown has developed a whole geography of Rodney's groundings in rural and urban uh, Jamaica. And I invite you to look at that exhibition. Rodney moved in the wider circles of the Rasta movement. And I want to identify one Rastafari who really had a big influence on Walter uh, and on all of us, uh, that is Rasnigos. And Rasnigos lived in Brownstown, Central East Kingston, not Brownstown, St. Anne. And we used to go to visit him and he was fully knowledgeable on all liberation movements taking place in Africa, particularly what had happened in Kenya, about which he felt very strongly. When you see Rasnigas, you see somebody who you could understand would put fear into the hearts of the political establishment. Because this was a Rasta with a revolutionary message uncompromising and very direct and highly intelligent. So other people can speak of Mortimer Plano, who was a mentor to people like uh, Bob Marley. But I want to turn to how I met Rodney. Uh, we met him, I met him in January of 1968 in Chancellor Hall. And uh, he was introduced to me by Winston Davis, who was then a sub-warden in Chancellor Hall. And Winston Davis had been my teacher at Calabar High School and was doing a thesis on Cuban literature since the revolution. And they had seized Winston's passport because this kind of topic on going to Cuba was not a part of what they considered an academic should be about, and going to Cuba was just not on. Uh, Winston had been associated with the Young Socialist League, and so 
Walter also had some connection with the Young Socialist League early on in his life as an undergraduate. So I met Walter and uh, we introduced him to the group on campus and um, we organized for him to speak, uh, talk in sequel, talk in the unions. He spoke off campus in several secondary schools. But the principal thing I remember is going to visit Claudius Henry in Greenbottom, was it? And being in his church, and all of Claudius Henry's work was financed by one woman, a woman called Edna Fisher. And Edna Fisher was a fish entrepreneur. And when you looked at the complex in Clarendon that they had, they had the church, they had a bakery, they had a cooking establishment, was a whole arrangement. None of that came out of Claudius Henry's efforts, pure Edna Fisher. And Garland raised the question of gender, but if the study of Claudius Henry neglects Edna Fisher, then you won't understand what gave Claudius Henry his strong social entrepreneurship. Uh, the other thing I re recall is Walter and the going to, in August 1968, going to George Six Park uh, to Mark Garvey's birthday, anniversary of Garvey's birthday, 68. And uh, in July of 68, the government of Jamaica had added to their ban list all the writings of the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X, uh, autobiography, all the writings of the Nation of Islam, anything at all. They had added to a whole list of Soviet uh, bans and Marxist bans. Uh, the black bands. And one of the feature of Walter's address at that anniversary was the attack on the government for this ban on black literature. The other thing that I will mention in the time remaining is the discussion we had, may have been at Jerry's yard, prior to Walter going to Montreal to the Black Writers Conference. Our advice to him was that he should not leave Jamaica. Because if he left Jamaica, the government would ban him, would prevent him from coming. Because bans were used by all Caribbean governments against black nationalists, against Marxists. Uh, uh, in that, towards the end of 68, Norman Gervin had joined Mona from St. Augustine, where Eric Williams had more or less said that he had to leave. So we knew that uh, Walter would be banned. Walter felt that he had a commitment to this conference of black writers. And if my mind doesn't serve me right, he carried some reggae writings, including some songs by Bob Marley. I, I, I quite remember that, that he selected some of that to, to explain to people that literature was being created not only in the sense in which we knew it, but they were create, being created by singers in studios. And this is an innovative thought which Caroline and others in cultural studies have developed on as text. Uh, the ban on Walter Rodney, uh, the figure of the pregnant Pat Rodney is the iconic figure for the mobilization of the students. People, most students were not really concerned about black power, but they felt an injustice had been done by keeping this man away from his pregnant wife, and she was showing big time. Uh, and that, that was an injustice that uh, people could not take. So, the meeting was organized in Mary Seacole Hall, well attended, heavy debate because there are people who supported the government there, including some of my progressive friends, um, and uh, who will be 
nameless. <laughs> I don't need to embarrass anybody at all. Uh, but they turn out to be progressive. But a good discussion, because there's a formidable woman who was a sub-warden in Mary Sequel Hall by the name of Gloria Lanaman, and formidable person. So the debates were good, heated, and you couldn't just lead these people by virtue of some allegiance to a water run. They had to be, you had to argue your case to get people out on the street. People like Bertram, to a lesser extent me, I give Bertram more credit. <laughs> so you won't tell any lies on me, because you swore into secrecy. Did a lot of mobilization off the campus. So because there were pre-existing structures the Walter had, people went into all the communities to indicate to them, we are going to protest this thing. This is unjust. This is unfair. And therefore, there was a coalescence of students and community. And of course, with any demonstration, that is popular. You gather forces. And it is the gathering of forces, the tear gassing, and so on, which really brought about the violence. I want to conclude in my presentation by going back to, that's my 15 minutes, just going back to how I started. For any radical transformation, it has to be sensible, intelligent, scientific, thought out. This is the arena where you can engage the best minds in the Caribbean and in the world if you are talking about transformation of the Caribbean today. Thank you very much. Greetings. I'm very happy to be here. I see many familiar faces. My favorite vice chancellor. Um, okay. The person who stands here is a very, very different person who was here at 18 years old in 1968. Um, St. Andrew High School graduate. I won the independent scholarship. And I was here to represent my family and my father, who, who no longer lived. I didn't see myself as African. I saw myself as a bright girl. OK, um, so when I came on campus now, two things. The Department of Geography, for the first time, had a course on the geography of Africa. Now, I had absolutely no idea about Africa, that I was African. Nothing, I was just dumb, yeah? So one thing was that I was, Barrington Floyd was a lecturer in the Department of Geography. So, also on one hand, he opened my eyes about the continent of Africa. Now we're just talking about geography here, not, nothing else. The other person was Walter Rodney. Now at the university, I, mean, I did geography and sociology, so it, it, I, wasn't, I didn't go to his lecturers because I had to go. His presence just opened something in me that I wanted to learn about Africa, because I discovered I was African. So every lecture that Walter gave, on campus, off campus, I would try to be there. Also, Walter made sure to tell us that we had a responsibility for our fellow man. So I was part of a group who gave classes on campus down in Augustown, um, teaching persons like myself, reading, writing, math, sewing, various skills. So 
I, I don't know if I, I can add, explain adequately how Walter triggered a complete change in me. And that change in terms of my love of Africa has remained until this day. That change I reflected in teaching my children. Um, and they will show that, that, no, that really did happen. So when we heard that water was banned, I, I, I couldn't understand. Mind you, I just saw Walter as this nice lecturer who told me about Africa and made me aware that I was a, a black woman. Um, I didn't have a, a political agenda, but I just knew that this was the man who opened my eyes. So when he was banned, I said, uh-uh. This is the, the roaring lion got awake, yeah? So I was part of that meeting in Mary C. Cole Hall, and part of the group that decided to walk down Mona Road, Hope Road. I was more than surprised when, I don't know how many people have seen the brochure for this conference, in which you see three young male students followed by a side of police, not one female student was in the picture. It hit me. I mean, I looked at the flyer initially, and it didn't hit me. But when I took it up the second time, I said, what? What, the? what were you all thinking about in the Department of History and whoever and whoever, that not one woman took part in it? That wasn't so. Anyway, so we marched down the road. Now, in those days, mainly middle-class students were on campus. And in fairness to the police, that was not a normal confrontation. That rarely happened. So the police were there to prevent us from going any further down the road. And every time we came upon the cordon of police, Somehow we managed to go around and through and went further and further down Hope Road. But when we reached near Jamaica House now, I suspect somebody must have given an order. I don't know for sure, but I suspect because the whole intensity of the situation changed. Don't let them pass Jamaica House. So we were a line of students across Hope Road, and I was this big Afro, a la, a la Angela Davis. And um, there were, the police approached, and I was there. There were students, fellow students on either side of me. And the police hand with the baton came down. Truthfully, he never reached my head. But to the onlooker, I was hit. Okay, so we continued. By then, no, tear gas. We had to be stopped by any means necessary. And fortunately, buses passing just opened their doors. In those days, um, there were houses along both sides of Hope Road. So we ran into the yards, and people gave us rags um, to cover our faces so that we wouldn't suffer the effects of the tear gas too much. And we got through. So the tactics were changed. Gordon House um, was the destination. Now I believe Jerry will give you the details of what happened when we reached downtown Gordon House. But and I'm gonna stop here, Carolyn. I'm gonna I'm gonna give other somebody else my minutes. <laughs> yes, but seriously, um, that man changed my life. And uh, he just made me aware to be the conscious black woman that I am today, that I have brought up my children to be proud Africans. University of the West Indies, I love the university. I was a university babe, I lived on campus. However, because I took part in the march, 
I had an uncle who lived in Trinidad, who represented Jamaica in Trinidad. And he came to Jamaica very quickly because he had to deal with this unruly niece who was really shaming her family. My independent scholarship was threatened. I almost lost it. And I just had to promise, uh -uh, no more activism, no more, just be quiet and be a good student. That part of it, I have always um, regretted it in a sense. My mother could not have afforded to pay for my university education, so I could not afford to lose a scholarship. Um, so I became less, ad less an act ad ad activist than I was before. But the whole notion of um, being an African, telling others about Africa, never left me and has never left me. And this is how I brought up my children, um, of whom I am very, very proud. So University of the West Indies, I do love the university. But at that time, it was so backward that I was embarrassed. Um, I do, I cannot leave on that negative note because um, the university really was my life. And my children have been here. And the, the role of the university in develop, helping to develop Jamaica is very, very important. Walter Rodney, I don't even think Walter really knew I existed because I wasn't a student of his, yeah? But um, I can't ever forget him because he changed my life. Thank you very much. Madam Moderator, I'm also going to observe the 15 minute imposition. <laughs> Brothers and sisters all. I just would like to pick up on something Rupert said in his mention of Ras Nigos. And I always remember one of the meetings when there was a discussion on the middle class. And Ras Nigos offered this definition. He says the middle class are those who the capitalists allow to live a higher purchase life. <laughs> Never forgotten that. No. Bunny spoke about downtown and the people she got help from and homes. And I see my good friend Marjorie Cobham in the audience. And I can never forget Mrs. Holding, her mother, St. George's Primary, those of us who finally made it to Duke Street. And she was the one who took in as much as she could with the water and the rag to get from the tear gas. But I always remembered her for the role she played on Duke Street in the middle of tear gassing and everything. Now I want to begin where I think Clinton Hutton started. What did Walter inherit when he came back here in 1968? What did he see? And the decade before Walter Rodney, very instructive. In 1958, the Rastafarians had what they call a universal Nyabingi, where they assembled island-wide at Bacawal for one week of groundation. Before, the raid on Pinnacle had brought to an end the idea of a Rastafarian community as having land on which to develop an economic enterprise. Once they were removed from Pinnacle, in Kingston Pen or Bacawal, whatever you call it, it was a much different existence. And they were the subject day to day of police brutality. But on the, start, the morning of this groundation, they all left Bacawal for a march into Kingston. The newspaper, the afternoon newspaper, spoke of the capture of Kingston by bearded men. 
but it was the first militant declaration of a Rastafari presence as a group in Kingston. At that donation, the man who hosted it was Prince Edward Emmanuel, tall, imposing figure. And there were two people attending that we should remember. One was a guest of his, Reverend Claudius Henry. The other was a young man who had come with his family, born in Cuba, had come out with his family. Later we would know him as Ras Mortimo Plano. Now, after that event in 1958, is when Claudius Henry established the church at Rosalie Avenue and took the title repair of the breach. Rupert was a year following me at Calabar, but it seems as if he entered Calabar doing this investigative journalism and writing, but from school, every little event, he was the one who followed it up. He first, and I can't remember anybody else writing about Edna Fisher, but after the Rodney Rebellion, I just want to say to you, Rupert, about a month ago, I got a letter from a man now living in Antigua. He was part of Henry's movement based in Veer. He knew Edna Fisher very well. And what he wrote to ask was, would I assist in starting a movement to have the four people buried at Spanish Town as common criminals for that matter to be revisited for as far as he was, there, he was concerned, they were heroes of black liberation. He was talking about Reynold Henry, Gabidon and the other two. The oldest was Reynold Henry, who was 28 years of age. The youngest was 22 years of age. He went into some detail to remind me that they paid for the food they took from the man at the shop. And the only black man that got hurt was an informer. <laughs> now, that's 58, 59. Very early after independence, a kind of disillusionment set in. And throughout that period, a lot of young people started expressing themselves politically or in journals or organizationally. The first was the Young Socialist League. I think I saw Keith Miller walk inside here. Oh, that was too small. And they had a slogan. Winston Davis, who was our teacher at Calabar, was a member of the league. So we got the literature of the league and everything, got to us to know some of the personalities that attend the meetings. But the league had a slogan, which I always remember, a slogan which says, the great only appear great because you are kneeling. Let us arise. <laughs> now, I think we might have been in sixth form. If he had come to university yet, but I told Rupert this. He said I mustn't say these stories, but <laughs> I remember him going down to interview Prince Buster. And when he went down there and he announced himself as a first year university student, Prince Buster stopped and called everybody on Orange Street that he could find for them to come and hear that a university student is down here to interview him, and he must be a man of some importance. <laughs> but the other event that was happening on the cultural scene was the emergence of a band called the Scatterlights. I never knew Tommy McCook then who led the band, but I got to know Tommy McCook after. And he was explaining to me that up until then, he played in a quartet with Aubrey Adams at Courtly Manor Hotel. And every night he's there, he says, playing these standards. Until he gets together with some of all these people who were at, what's the name of the Catholic school? The Alpha. Alpha. Mm -hmm. And he says, 
possibly the most scandalized only stayed together for 17 months. And the music they put out is remarkable in that 17 months. But what Tommy McCook related to me, he said, after coming out of that, playing these things, these old standards, Scatter Lights opened with a song called Freedom Sound. And to have heard Freedom Sound, you know exactly what it was saying. But in the period, all across Jamaica, different groups emerged. I see DK Duncan here. I was in Brownstown, he came there in 1965 as a dentist. Then, everybody says that, not everybody, but you start to hear a word that he's in discussion and this man, some say he's a socialist, some say he's a communist. But what I remember after meeting DK, I don't think we ever went out that we didn't have to alert somebody to come and bail us just in case we're arrested. <laughs> Wherever DK was, there was going to be some disturbing of the neighborhood, whatever it was. But every Sunday morning, Every weekend when we came to Kingston, we'd do a round of visits. Hugh Small, who was then, Socialist League had been disbanded. There was George Beckford here on campus. There was Barry Miles across UTEC. And it was a round of people who at different parts of the country and some in the capital city all had something going. When Walter arrived, how much of a minister are carrying? <laughs> when Walter arrived in 1968, I think his Rupert alerted me to this. It was a decade in which the history department here had been doing some very progressive work about the teaching of history, both at university and in high school. I was at sixth form in 1962 when they announced that for the first time you could take West Indian history in high school. So the third point. So quite a number of us went and grabbed up the course and go to thing to do history in sixth form, West Indian history. But Walter, in his letter to the university when he was returning, made the point that he was com my main commitment is to UWI, to help start a program in West African studies. Because as far as he could observe, with all the progress that had been made in the study of West Indian history, it needed to be rooted in the studies, particularly of West Africa, to bring a more complete understanding to an African Jamaican audience. Now, it's now 50 years since we are celebrating the 50th anniversary. And very quickly, one of the things I want to cherish most about Walter, and that is, he was very concerned not to create divisions. I can't remember him doing or saying anything that sought to create divisions among African Jamaicans or people of African descent. And his studies, the study in the, that was mentioned originally, Upper, Upper Guinea, 1485. If you read it, he's alerting us to the fact that we need to understand the social and economic processes that could have so weakened African unity as to make it vulnerable to the most rapacious designs of Europe. I never understood fully that lesson until much later. And that was a book that I think Ruby edited on Marcus Garvey and Don Robotham wrote an essay, The Emergence of an African Ethnicity. And you looked at the study which said, why had all these rebellions from Sutton's in 1692 right down to Taki in 1760? Don't come to anything. Look at the numbers. There are so many Africans versus these couple thousand whites in the island. And at the heart of it, I think a planter from Barbados, Leslie, pointed to it. He says the divisions that had been brought over from Africa were such that every time a rebellion was planned, there would be somebody to carry the story to the planters so as to nullify all possibilities of success. So 
when I read Rodney, and then I read that particular essay. And it dawned on me that if you don't read those two essays in understanding the history of revolt during plantation slavery, it's hard to make a complete picture. Secondly, I was always a little bit never fully understood why when we got a new constitution in 1884 and we had a majority of the votes, we could not elect more people of African descent. Two things alerted me. The Morant Bay Rebellion and Asi Clinton Hutton, who wrote a piece on the political activities in St. David. But even with those two, I needed Swithin Wilmot, who wrote a piece on black political activism at the grassroots, for all three to make sense in this way. The unity that they were trying to build between black and colored early politicians came to an end very quickly. Jordan who was the leader at the time of emancipation. By the time he got nominated to the Legislative Council, it was no more. Blacks were one side, colors were one side. You elected a black man in 1847, you have five, and by 1863 elections, you have none. Both sides could not agree as to conduct an electoral strategy. So they entered the period on the air completely divided, both black and colored divided. In St. David, the parish between Kingston and St. Thomas, a group there led by Bogle's brother-in-law, and Clinton has written a part of this. It's not me talking nothing. But to put all these things together, they elected nine out of 11 black vestrymen in St. David. But over in St. Thomas, it was the black Bogle, quite apart from Gordon, with whom we had, but the unity between blacks and coloreds had completely been eroded. Blacks were on their own. And the savagery and the revenge that air wrecked on these people. You know that he killed Bogle and Gordon. He wiped out the entire black vestry out of St. David at the same time. An American who was here, Willis Menard, the first African American to be elected to the US Congress, he deported him. But he completely beheaded the movement as far as he could see here. And it was years after that blacks had the confidence again to start. Not only that, Lorna Goodison has written a book which I urge everybody to read. It's about her family who had to run from St. Thomas after the rebellion. When it came down, Bogle came under attack from every quarter. He became the cause why everybody was suffering. She says everybody with the name Bogle had to run Lee St. Thomas after the Martin Bay Rebellion. Some changed the name to Bogle, some to Boggy, some to whatever it was. She said her family reached as far as Westmoreland. And it took way down until Robert Love for us to have recovered to again build a political momentum. So I close with this. If it's one lesson that we take forward on this 50th anniversary of Walter, Rupert has already spoken of what it takes to move forward. None of the vehicles we created in the 60s survive to this day in a political form. We need to create new vehicles, and he has alerted us to what kind of vehicles will carry us forward. But beneath it all, make us do everything to prevent any unnecessary division in our ranks. Thank you very much. Yes, hello. Well, I'm very glad to see everyone here. Uh, but I just want to clarify some kind of say Walter Rodney. Uh, I deal with rights and all of we are dealing with rights before we know him. But even before that, I want to thank uh, Mikey Barnett for inviting, inviting us here, inviting me here for the 50th. <laughs> I didn't want to say this before I clap, because I'm not sure if I'm going to be here for the 100th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but but they have my number still. But um, I see a sign around there. It's, it's a couple of years I see that it kind of look discriminatory, or, or, or if it's not discriminatory, it's confusing because the the arrow point to the the, the washroom, and, and it's saying no loud talking, no bare feet, no lying down, and no eating. And I don't know if it is a sign about the undercraft or is the washroom alone. <laughs> but, but still, it's still it's discriminatory because even, even more to have some session, him start some great session and encourage everybody to go down to Victoria Pier. You see how nice Victoria Pier was for us, you know, the 50s, 6th farm association. I wasn't in 6th farm, but I don't know it was nice. And then now, the first invitation Muta sent out, it said, must put on your dancing shoes and come. And there's, anyway, long story short is that, long story short, ma'am? Yeah, long story short is that, um, um, the black beauty that them did ban, is she, is either she or what, I don't know if she or what I really pick up on that, but this Siaga did, um, suspect that the black beauty was a Trojan horse and, and them decide to ban, ban, ban the book. But anyway, I'm not going to discuss anything much. I'm just going to read out some points. Because these paper here is only three of them have been writing. Don't, don't, don't bother fret about them. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, um, I'm just going to read out some points. And then no, anybody want to discuss any of them, we can discuss them. But the first one is that the undercraft, from the undercraft to the assembly hall, very important. Um, here's where, here's where they made group up. I still see and there are people then when I was going to give them the, um, the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. And also, here is where when, uh, even Mandela is, is here, and then over to the assembly hall. And then now when Manly win in 72, one of the first appearances he made after winning the election, because he you know, ended kind of lay low for a few days, was here when he came to meet with the students. And then I remember when it finished, Screeb, Arnold Bertram, bring him across there, me and Peter Phillips and the next Peter Buford. She had a van with red, gold, and green tam. And Screeb bring him across there, remember? <laughs> And, and we, we yell when we yell him, you know. But we never feel good about the rod. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, Joe Mo Kenya to give him a rod. And Michael make sure he never come out of his mouth. When them land back at Jamaica, and Michael hold up the rod. Somebody say, what that? And the man say, ooh, a rod of correction, man. <laughs> But Michael himself never out of it out of mouth. But Claudius Henry, who they got to print the pamphlet and all those things. Little after the election, Claudius Henry come under some serious pressure from the government. Is Liza? I would have liked some explanation for that. Next thing. <laughs> and I'm joking, a serious thing. He helped to get the government elected. And immediately after the election, he come under some serious pressure. I'm not joke. And it was over land too. And other things. Well, Coming down before, I was going to some points, before um, 68 and then after 68. Bakawal and Shantytown, before Siaga and uh, name? Tavares bulldozed it and build there. Bakawal and Shantytown, and especially Sam Brown, feel it as one of the most articulate Rastafari. Uh, one of the most articulate Rastafari. And, um, then Tavares now, just remember, just write down some point, because I can't discuss it too much. Tavares said go to Ethiopia in 1964, go study locust housing. And when he was there, his majesty gave him, said he would like to contribute to education in Jamaica. And he gave him some values. He gave him some cash on our year, that he gave him some raw gold also. He gave him some values. To come, it's a joke. He gave him some values to come and establish a polytechnic year it was in Jamaica. Well, up to the time when his mice were coming on the bill. But in the meantime, now Tavares started campaigning. You know, political non diploma you have certain names. Like, you know, PJ's Young, Gifted and Black, Fresh Prince, and so on. And then we, uh, what's his name? Dudley Thompson, Burning Spear. When Tavares come back at the next election, 
are the conquering line of South West St. Andrew. <laughs> you think I drop? Don't wear Porsche, see it there. I dox him, him campaign and then I win the seat 67, you know. And no school, no bill. Anyway, I want to tell the events that lead out that making people get rot and you say rot. <laughs> Make people get in rot and rot more. Anyway, enter the university in 1966 as soon as Selassie left. Yeah? Some people don't like when I say Selassie. People want, want, want me to bow them and say Imperial Majesty. I'm a, I am a Rastafari. Right? I do not worship his Imperial Majesty because the Rastafari is not a religion, but it has been made into such by some. And the Christ when he did come here he was not about no religion. He was about teaching people how to make over themselves and also to overthrow the Roman them from over him. It was not a religion and he never demanded no worship, nor required it. He had been misled by the people who remain behind and form an organization and start take up collection. It happened all the while. <laughs> it happened all the while. I'm not, I'm not angry with them. You know. I'm not angry with them. It's a human phenomenon. You know. people, need, people need religious practice. Some people do. And it is very useful. I'm telling you that Rastafari did not start as no religion. And I do not worship Isla Selassie. I'm a godfather. Ronald Small, I'm a old man. Isla Selassie, I'm a godfather. Next godfather, Marcus Gavi. You know, say, you know, under the so-called Christian religion, you have the male of two godfathers and one god godmother. Well, I'm Marcus Gavi and Selassie, I'm a two godfather. You know, I'm a I'm a godmother. You don't understand me. Let's do a neighbor. Anyway, I don't want to dwell too long on that. <laughs> anyway, as, if, as soon as Selassie left here, yeah, God White, the first Rastafari. Right? I have a pause, you know, because you see, if, when I feel them way, if you stop from all going like me, I cry and all of it, some bad word to harass me. I feel out most time, you know, but I don't, want, I don't want to do that. I don't, no, 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 when you say bad word, you know, an Englishman say a bad word, Englishmen say a bad word. All right, let's go. Young Socialist League now, them crush it down, because you know, say in 1942, the British make a deal with Buster Man to say, but we'll let you out of prison. He was in prison in the camp. We'll let you out of prison if you left the PNP right away and denounce them. Made a deal. They said, we will make you win the first election. He made a deal and that's how they win the first election. Ten years later, them tired of Buster Man to come and get enough trouble, because you know, them set it up for the two parties, swaps up. Every country in the world where the British set up. Not only the British. Ten years later, they said to the PNP, if you get out there, communist them. And if we get out the 4-H, we will allow you to win the next election. It wasn't as simple as that, but that was part of it. So now, 10, 12 years later, the young socialist league get crushed down. Them kick out some and them disperse it. And a lot of the young socialist league, a lot of the new world people, a lot of the leftists who have some great ideals, some of them might not be practicable, but we admire them. A lot of them start to advocate the black power sentiment that was flooding all over the world, not just out of America, especially after the assassination of Malcolm X. So the Young Socialist League, them drifting towards black power. You don't understand me. And then now Rodney faces the same thing in Tanzania. Because Rodney kick up in Tanzania, and his good friend Julius Nairi get uncomfortable and ask him quietly to leave. And him come back to Jamaica, come back into the Caribbean, come back to home. You understand it? These things happening little by little. So, next thing, light record now, 1967, come check me. Me, I work at the bank, me left the bank, and I said, I want to publish some things, and I start right. And coincidentally, light record, come check me. Just leave England, tell him, say, Richard Small, so I come, must come check me, because my brother is a young ass. And he come ask me if me, would I help him write a play about how a middle class youth become a raster. Well, I was writing something like that, but I know middle class. My parents are middle income. A middle income, they're my middle income. <laughs> Um, anyway, Marina Maxwell at the same time was writing a play along some very similar line. And it, this is early 68, you know. And it named Play Mass. And she asked if we help her. So, anyway, next thing, Ras Dizzy. From 67 now. Ras Dizzy. And myself and historian and some more Ras, including ID and Homer. And some more with G. White, Peter Phillips. We start. Assemble now, so we're going to kick up Ross next year at Jamaica. Because next year is human rights here, and they dare not move against us. Because the Jamaican government did uh, suggest to the United Nations, so we must have a human rights here. The United Nations said, okay, let it be 1968. Little did Sharon know that him, the delegate, we went to the United Nations and proposed that. Never know that he was going to be prime minister at the time. So we're planning from 67 
So we're going to activate certain things where they dare not move against us. But this is not just about publishing a paper. It's preliminary to all the different things. Because by this time, it's a very similar time to now, 50 years later you now. Most of the population was starting to be disillusioned with both parties. There was already disillusioned with the JLP and, in, and the independence. Not completely now. Some nice thing about independence. Especially things like the exertion of themselves, the, you know, the musician and the people through the music, scatterlights. I will give credit to where it's due. Norman Manley do some good things, not him alone, him get the idea from people, but him implement it. Him implement JBC, can't go in that, we never want to discuss that, we just want to name out something. <laughs> anyway, um, so we are organizing in 67, so next year is one Ross, don't ever do on them. Anyway, Siaga now and Wilton Hill now. Wilton Hill got suggest to in the parliament, because Wilton is a kind of renegade in the, in the Labour Party, a liar. He suggested the parliament say, move out the queen from the head of state and make Silas the head of state. <laughs> Siaga and him never take tea, but they kind of depend on the same side. But Siaga and him can't take tea. Siaga approached one of my brethren now, down in a salt lane, Rasta man, Thunder. Fitra Elliott is a professional cyclist in a Matthews lane and salt lane. When a Dudley Thompson right hand, they call him guns. <laughs> and see, I got approach him down there and say, I don't like your presence down here. Especially like how you're amongst Dudley Thompson as well. The reason why they call you guns. And to make a cut a long story short, guns move come up August town. We're good bridging that. Anyway, next thing now. Salt Lane come up to August town. Yes, well now this youth see I now. Him coming to the attention of Buster on the island of Jamaica, 1958, him start writing at Gleena. Why the PNP winning and why them going to win again? This was a year of the federal election. Said the GLP now match them with, with you know, match them tick for tat. The PNP is using certain organizations from way back in the 38, like the Jamaica Teachers Association, the Jamaica Agricultural Society, all of these organizations is usually pro-PNP people. People thinking about national building on national people, you know, JTA, UNI, well, some UNIA, some early Rastafari, uh, Jamaican Agricultural Society, all of these people, 4-H Club, and Siaga is saying a lot of these people, including civil servants, is campaigning for the PNP while working in civil servant office is illegal, and if they don't stop it, if the JLP don't stop it, they now in a more election. Furthermore, the PNP have some beards where move amongst them and move into the truck and protect them from the bad man them of, of, of uh, Buster Man, they used to run them off of the street. And starting with Matthews Lane, Group 69, the PNP start back with the intimidation of Buster Man. But lately now, it's the a, it's a beards, the Rasta Man, them in West Kingston, will become in the, uh, the physical force and see how start one. But read back the glean of them 1958. That's how Buster Man they get for you about him. Then now, Singham Man Siaga, Archie Singham. Look how you tell them about Archie Singham. Archie Singham was a sociologist. On the campus, I him teach Carl Stone how to make pole and thing. But he was also close to Siaga, the JLP. And he was one of the philosophers. He was Siaga, the main philosopher. The DK can correct me if I'm from Australia. And they are the philosopher behind JLP. They run pole and him and, and show and him river, him good in that pole and him know how to strategize. Sing him. On the other side, now you have M.G. Smith. We you believe him only a study raster. M.G. Smith at MI6. All intelligence out of England. Jamaica white man still now. And he been warning Norman Manley from the early, from 55 when Norman Manley took over. So you watch them Rasta man, you know. That is the force, that is the real danger. And he warned Norman Manley, and he come back and warn Michael Manley too. And he see me help organize Green Bay, M.G. Smith. I don't hate them, you know, I'm to tell the truth. All right. Rodney, we are lead up, we are lead up to Rodney. Look here, this thing is not about Rodney, you know. This thing is about Rodney linking with the people them out there who is dangerous, the Rastafari and some other people you and I hear. So we don't want to turn it into a hero worship or Rodney, you know. Them turn it to Jesus Christ now hero worship. Turn Celestia in a hero worship. And them think they get you, they just get you lazy. And just lick pure pipe and I say, Celestia, go do this and Celestia, go do that. <laughs> All right now. Claudio Senri. Claudio Senri and the Cuban collection. All right. In a 68, now through the activity we are going from 67, we we'll start publishing paper. We have to go all about, go visit people all around the island and make the links. Rodney, we are carrying Rodney. So Rodney carries some place, we carry him other place, but we carry more places than we can. I know some man from 
when I was a student. You know. I defend all the Rasta movement from when I was a student. Yeah. Not a Rasta, you know, defending the Rasta movement. All right. We're going to check all DK. You see, I'm going to go check DK. Sometime we reach a brown stomach group, you know. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, Sometimes we brown stomach group, check the like command. You know. And DK saying go dig up the supermarket owner. You know. Three o'clock come on and say, My little youth brethren from town, you have to load up them pick up with grocery. I'm not I'm not extort them, you know. I'm pay for that, you know. I a dentist, you know. <laughs> anyway, me only I tell you say, when we go check them on the album, them take care of it. DK, George Myers and Savlam are all about them take care of it. And also we take care of people too. DK fix every fix every man mouth. Show me, show me now, you got to go to a, 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 a comprehensive clinic. Once you go there, they say, which teeth hurt? And I show them. And I say, it want to fill them. They say, we don't have time to fill it. I pull it out. I have 17 of my teeth, they pull out. Till I buck up DK and DK start filling my teeth and fix my teeth. You know what <laughs> And I fix everybody's teeth. But well, anyway, let's go now. Claudio Senri and the Cuban Connection. You hear me? Claudio Senri and the Cuban Connection. More time I drive with Walter and one day I drive with him just turn in a place. When me, when me say, where you go? He say some, some Cuban live here you know, and them this and that. I say, no. If you tell me where, no, you know, just take care of me to go now. I don't just go to say, no. I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of danger, you know. I'm going to go through more, that's much danger as anybody. But you have to tell me before. You know what I'm saying? I'm invited to go down to Claudius Henry. I'm here the only man to go. I'm not afraid of Claudius Henry, you know. But the amount of police spy over there, I say, I don't care to go. And then I'm going to link up with the people afterward and we'll go, we go, we go, we go, we go. But, but I admire where I'm going to All right. We, Ethiopian World Federation, we were determined from 1966 to get a chart of the Ethiopian World Federation. I listen to set it up. Because in a, in a London 1937, Marcus Garvey sent go check I listen from 1936 and he not get no reply. Four or five times he write letter to him. He not get no reply, but he must send it through Royal Mail. And you know Royal Mail now go deliver no. I believe a joke now. Mr. Uh. <laughs> Royal Mail not going to deliver no, no communication from me to DK or from me to, 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 to um, Professor Beckles. Because them know so we link up. They're not going to do it. Marcus Garvey kind of get irritable and start, little by little, start criticizing Silas until him go on, until him start cause Silas. His mother can't rely upon you and I no longer. I'm used to defend him you know, and them used to defend him. So I'm going to set up an organization. I'm, he set up a position in Ethiopian World Federation. He started to land to it afterward. Afterward, he said, well, we want a chart of this. You know. When Ralta come, and he said, why you that guy's own farm organization? And he's the most progressive young Rasta in Jamaica. I don't know everybody. We say, yeah, yeah, you know. At the Ethiopian World Federation. He said, Ethiop he said, the Federation is a dead thing. You know, Walter talk already. Federation is a dead thing. So anyway, him still carry go over Federation meeting. Because you know, we never know local 31. And he's still, he still linked with them. You know. Anyway, long story short. Is that ID and Negus? You have some man where some radical Rasta man, them they're in a federation business, not a Jesus business. And all them with it. Man like Bobby Righteous, Bobby Hamilton, Amiglin come, family them grow up in a thing. Him father. No, but Bonnie says she give me five, it's only ten minutes she used. <laughs> anyway. Alright, me I'll tell you about Bobby Righteous and ID and Negus and them man there. I'm Prince Buster, you don't understand me, I'm Neville Sachs and, and them and them. And I want to get to tell you about DK, it's a long list of them. Plano, Plano now, I don't can't tell you about Plano. New World start regroup now, after the Rodney thing. And while Rodney there, New World start regroup, all who they get disillusioned. New World, young socialist league man, start regroup, you know, and them say something, not going to go on, because PNP not allow them, for, you know, and them start regroup. When them ban Rodney now, form a, a newspaper, them farmer bang them a regroup. New world a regroup from it. Young Socialist League, whole left leftists and thing. Rasta same way. But at the same time, some of the man them must say, I kind of suppress the Rasta. Because we're not dealing with worship, you know. But at the same time, some people are trying to suppress the Rasta thing. Anyway, them hold me and them try to put me in prison. Woman here and return. Monroe return. Man start come back, you know. Woman here and return. Monroe return from Oxford. Because, you know, nature. It does not um, uh, a vacuum, I know which vacuum I talk about. For Trevor's favorite word is maneuver, maneuver, maneuver. <laughs> so anyway, Richard Small returned. 
But Lax the Comer take flight. When I last speech, we Lax the Comer take, you know. Lax the Comer come from London, and I talk for Wallet, Walter, we call him Brian Wallet, too. Platform, you know. He said, No, after them ban Rodney. He said, you, you, you ban Walter Rodney, you joke. You, you have one named Richard, small time, him, turn, him, him catch back in, you better shot him at the airport. <laughs> anyway, but them, they inflammatory thing, you know. You make me last the third page, you know. <laughs> anyway, I said, Go. I only want to show you. I only want to show you one thing. Where the last thing here? I only want to show you one thing. Yes, the Marxist overthrow of Selassie. Marxist overthrow of Selassie in, in Ethiopia. Michael Manley no said nothing all now. No, no said nothing about it. 1972, half time win. He sent Dudley Thompson and Planner to Ethiopia. Go check Selassie. May I tell you that? I asked His Majesty. Could you invite Michael on a state visit? His Majesty know about the radar argument and them things. You know? His Majesty said, I am not so much interested in visits from heads of state. I'm more interested in visits from individuals and organizations. Martin Plan and all the times I care about the news come gay thing there. Anyway, assassination attempt on the Bob Marley. All know the JLP do apologize for that, you know. Green Bay, two years later by the PNP administration. All know the PNP no apologize for that yet, you know. Yet they want to make Siaga a national hero. Wholeness is planning to make Siaga a national hero. And they're willing to make a trade-off. Like when they was going back bust a national hero, they say, okay, we'll make Norman want to. And they're willing to make Michael a national hero. They are planning to make Siaga a national hero. I tell you that. Anyway, Manly, both, and then Marley, Bob Marley let both Manley and Siaga have the hook at the peace concert, call them up on the stage, and make them hold hands and say one love and all them way. And yet Bob Marley know you know that they ambush in the night and all those things. Both sides, them, um, them try to put me in prison 68, and then 76 the PNP lock up 92 away, out of one yard, all up away you know, 92 away and carry God. A, a, a no man land, trying to frame it, say we have links with GLP, you can imagine? And Tony Spalding, they behind that, you know. And Dudley Thompson. And after Claude Massop was assassinated, Siaga and Dudley Thompson turned bosom friend. You hear me tell you? After Claude Massop was assassinated. But you hear me know, this is the book, Ikel Toraz. It won America's Prize for Literature, 1976. And 80 pages in this book tell you about the march. You can imagine? 80 pages telling you about the march on the 16th of October, 1978. You can imagine? Then now, the next piece of thing we may do, I'm sure. Let me see. See the next book there, where is it? We, we, we start a thing named, it named African Youth Move. Because you know, Rasta not to deal with men business. So we say we don't call it no movement. So we just call it African Youth Move. And then now, little more now in America about two years year later. Some youth start, some dreadlocks youth, them start this thing named Move. Right now, Move. And then look more even scree, start that thing at Johnstown named Paul Bogle Youth Move. Youth move. Allow me to tell you. Cash Rota. Cash you? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's good. All these things was happening. I'm done, man. Oh, hold on, one more thing. <laughs> See, Joe? I mean, application in, a new, uh, in a England, 1973, September. Forget a US visa. Three years me I try you now from Jamaica. I fought the seven years before them give me, I marched them give me one. And guess how them, guess how them give me a visa after 47 years applying for visa. Walter Rodney conference in Detroit and Atlanta. And Trump, Trump gave me visa for go to Walter Rodney. You draw a big card there, man. You draw a big card. I tell you, all of these people could speak for, you know, the whole forum, but we can't do that. So I just want to thank each of them, Rupert, Bonnie, Arnold, and um, Bob and Jerry, for these engaging presentations. We're going to open up now to the audience. If you want to make a comment, please just, there's a mic there. I'm recognizing... Professor Erna Broadbuck first. If you want to say something, please join the line. 
We also have in the audience Julian Jingles, who has written a novel which has something to do with the Rodney events. I am going to ask him to just join the line quickly and say what you have to say about the book, sir. Anybody else? And please, we can't have any long speeches because there are many people who want to say something and there are refreshments there and I know people want to get to the refreshments eventually. So, um, just before we start the question and answer period, I just want to announce that on Friday, the 19th, this Friday, from 10 to 12 at the regional headquarters, there'll be a seminar by Professor Meeks, Cleaning Up the Colonial Mess, Persistent Poverty in Social Decline and Social Decline, and it will be hosted by the Center for Reparation Research. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Bradbo. Can we have some order, please? The intellectual tradition Rupert talked about that yes. preceded um, Walter, but I only heard Scree mention um, G. Beck and um, Jerry mention New World. I wonder whether Rupert would say something about the New World, the New World group, and whether they indeed did anything like, like stirring the waters and making it possible for a new kind of thinking on the university campus to take place. Yes. Okay, New World did a lot. Um, it was started in Ghana by a group of people among whom was Lloyd Best. Uh, but certainly by 68, New World was very active on the campus, uh, stimulating discussions. And New World was a, had a pretty broad canvas. Some of you will remember Wilmot Perkins. But I remember he participated in New World discussions. They tried to get national discussions going. Norman Gervon presented a report to New World on the 1968 events, which was part of the discussion they had as to how they should respond to the events. Uh, I think that the New World and the regional intervention that they made um, had a big impact on the Treaty of Chagaramos in 1973 because uh, Havelock Brewster, C.Y. Thomas, uh, and one other economist uh, really were the architects of the economics of regionalism. But I think Erna herself uh, can comment on the question that she asked and add to our discussion of this as someone who was at the time involved and active in New World. And I think some of her early fictional work was a debate and discussion with some of the thinking in New World and she may want to comment on that. Erno, since you ask and can answer. I wasn't so deep and important as you're making it sound, Rupert. I used to go to the meetings, but I wasn't understanding a lot. But one of the things, one of the things that has followed me all the way through is Lloyd Best talking about us as intellectual workers. Mm -hmm. We were all looking with, with um, 1962, we're all saying, what are we doing in this place called the university? What can we do when we get out of here, or we walk outside of here? And Lloyd Best and the New World Group pointed us to the fact that you are like everybody else. You might get scholarship, but the others don't. But you are like everybody else. We need with plumbers, we need with carpenters, we need with lawyers, we need everybody. We need you who have been allowed to study. We need you. You are a worker. You just happen to have intellect as your skill. You are an intellectual worker. That has never left me. And that is what I have to say. So the, the academic is not superior to any other worker. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just thought I'd share one or two things. First, that i quite thrilled to be here. I've never been to something quite like this, and it's revealed quite a few things to me that explain some experiences I had many years ago in Montego Bay. Um, back in the late 70s, I had a, a command engagement with the Water Commission 
in charge of the island's water laboratories. So I had to go out inspecting water in every parish. I had a driver. Some districts we went through sounded quite hostile. I recall some shouts, go back to England, Colonel Gordon. I looked at my driver rates and uh, he just kept a stiff upper lip and pretended he didn't hear. Um, but I can understand it now because some of those came in that area, Coral Gardens. Uh, apparently when I got to Montego Bay, everybody knew everything about me that I didn't even know about myself. So uh, given the rioting and now hearing about the shooting in that area, I can well understand the antipathy of those people when I was driving through. The odd thing is I reported it to uh, the Water Commission Command in Kingston, where the chief engineer is something like one of your generals, General Lawson, uh, Engineer Lawson. When I told him, he said, well, you know, Lloyd, you have to have a sense of humor. So coming here and listening uh, you know, to um, the frightful things that happened to our melanated brethren during those time periods, um, it's good to see that there is uh, humor among you. So I just thought I'd share this last bit that don't feel too bad because um, English people have had a pretty rough time from black people. Um, if you remember, I don't know how much you know about British history, but the Stuart Kings, the term Stuart means black. So a lot of white people were actually under black domination for quite some time in England. And if you check the history books, the Stuart period extend for some time because there are two of them. Um, Charles I and Charles II. And in fact, there's a almighty um, battle in Ireland which involved uh, Charles II because they resented him. Um, if you also check further in the books, King James was of black descent. They didn't like to admit that. In fact, all the paintings in London uh, don't reflect that. They sort of white it out. But right. James, you know, I don't think so, too many of us will take. Um, um, I think we should have a, as, as General Lawson said, have a sense of humor. So. Yes, but that is a bad joke. <laughs> Comes Dr. Susan, who, who has organized the exhibition at the University Museum. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. I just wanted to start by congratulating um, the Institute for, for this gathering. I think one of the fascinating things about this week is how many different perspectives on what happened 50 years ago are being brought together um, by the various entities. And as Carolyn mentioned, we are having an exhibition uh, at the UA Museum and we are collaborating with the Department of History on a conference taking place. I just wanted to mention though all of the persons who, are, who have been talking tonight, I was very happy to see, are persons who we have actually interviewed as part of a process where we're trying to gather information uh, as part of a kind of Caribbean memory project. And Mark Figaro, who is kind of sitting off there, is, is one of the persons who has been helping to spearhead that and who is now uh, an honorary research fellow for the UA Museum and for the University Archives. And so any of you who, who may feel that there are more stories to tell, we, we have interviewed a couple of dozen people so far, uh, many of them relating to the Rodney, uh, what we've called disturbance, uh, given that it had so many different elements to it, but um, this also having to do with the university and its relationship to the development of the Caribbean region. So we're always looking for more persons uh, whose stories need to be told. So bear it in mind and um, you know join us because I think that is a lot. A lot. There's a lot more stories that need to be to be told and hopefully written and to become part of the research material and canon. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Francis Brown. Yes, Mr. Jingles. Greetings, and thanks for the invitation and for me to be here. Uh, I went to Kingston Bookshop today and begged them to lend me a copy because I thought I would be reading one page based upon what I was told. But uh, I'm still happy to be here. The key thing is this. Uh, the 60s is an extremely important time for Jamaica. Arguably, it could be 
the most important period in Jamaica's history, the 60s. And very volatile, very creative. And my novel, A Reason for Living, was really inspired by the 60s and was written 80% of it between 1966 and 1968. I was so engrossed in my writing that I met Walter only once when he came to Donun Park, uh, Wembley in the East. We were one of the points, one of the flashpoints that Arnold and Walter and those people would come to to see what the youths and feel what the youths were feeling and saying at the time. And so I met Walter the first time he visited, the first one of those communities. But I was writing the third draft of my novel and I didn't go back to any of the meetings or get more involved because I'm a writer. So I thank you and uh, hopefully in January or February I will be back in Jamaica to do a book launch of A Reason for Living. But it's available at the Kingston Bookshop. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I am referring to the response by Mr. David Kaur um, to Mr. Shearer's speech in Parliament in 1968, right? Um, oh, I identify myself. My name is Michael Burke. All right. Yes, I'm no. sorry. I should have asked people right. to introduce yes. themselves. If you could okay. do that when you come right. up now. Okay. No. Um, after going home from Jamaica College in my steel bottom cadet boots, it was cadet day because there were no vehicles and listening to Mr. Shearer that night and saying he was going to make a speech the following day in Parliament, and he did, and he pr produced this um, pamphlet that said, tactics, 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 burn UWI, burn UWI. No, <laughs> the response of David Kaur was not put in the Gleaner, which was the only paper then, uh, daily. But it was in public opinion. He said there was absolutely not a shred of evidence that the pamphlet came from the university. And wh whatever we may want to say about R um, Rodney in Tanzania and whatever else, you know, this particular thing is, I would like to know the truth. It is very significant to me that Mr. Shearer never repeated those words outside of Parliament where he could be, where, where, because you know in Parliament you have the parliamentary privilege, you can't be sued for libel, defamation of character, or slander. Okay, now I'd like somebody to tell me, was that pamphlet ever, because Mrs. Rodney said when she was leaving here, right, um, to go to Tanzania, that the pamphlet was printed at the Ministry of External Affairs and the Prime Minister's office at that time was at 24 East Street, right? Across the way from um, Heroes Park, they were the Minister of Finances. No. Was that pamphlet ever made at the university? Personally, I don't think so, but I'd like to hear from somebody whether it was... Right. Roops, okay. yeah. can you answer? Thank you. No, I've never heard of that pamphlet. It was. All right, I think we're going to get the right answer from yeah. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, a lot of those things was printed like by them, but like the the picture with the rod with 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 with, with Michael with Silas Nermiglan, Michael on one side and Henry on one side. They made Henry take responsibility for printing that. But also, there are some things that really did happen. Some, some of the things they made up, you know. But some of the things did happen. Including that, uh, turn the camera up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you know. Who is your recording person, Jerry? Yes, anyway. You can't including when, the sociologist when, to get um, camera Shira, man, you know. When Shira, quote in a parliament, say, one Ross get up in the student union and say, give us, you, are the, you have the brains, we have the brawn, just give us the guns and we will do the rest. That was said by Negus. I was there. Some of the things was said and some was not said. But you know Babylon, them build pan, you know Trump, you know Trump state. You know, you know Shh, Trump. You can't rush the man. You, me? you know Trump and Ross, you know, he told them a friend and he told them go and let them on a friend and them with it. Hold up the mic, Jerry. And then now... Jerry, hold up the mic. Yes. They, them, them a friend. And then now, another thing. Walter Rodney did say in student union, who will come with me and take up a machine gun and go down to God now? He did say that. 
And some of the things that were said, that some of the things where you me said, was not um, never so kosher if you want to keep your, your powder dry. But they did build up things against me. Is our pants just like this? Them come lapping up in here now. After we <laughs> leave. All right, Jerry. Up in here. And our pants just... Them la, and so them, the pamphlets? Them make me strip off my attack, man. Them, them strip off my pants. Jerry. Naked in a, in a half a tree police station in front of everybody. That ras. Jerry, can you answer about the pamphlet? You know anything? Tell about the pamphlet already. Oh, all right. Thank you, Jerry. Uh. Jerry said some of the things in the pamphlet are true and some are not true. But did they come out of you? Eh? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, Jerry, thank you. Can you introduce yourself, please, sir? Yeah, Richard Jacobs. Yes, sir. Now, there, there are two things I, I wanted to inquire because I was um, intimately involved in the mm -hmm. early stages of the. Um, Rodney um, development. There is a list that came out of the university and it has 10 names on it. Those 10 names are known to the researchers in the, in the department of... Uh, of um, Government? No, 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 no. In the, in the, in the, the museum. Oh. Right? And um, I just wanted to know if the university was involved in preparing that list. If the University of the West Indies was involved in preparing that list for whoever. That's one thing. The second thing I wanted to clarify a bit is what Rupert was saying about uh, my role in mobilizing a university um, team. Um, I must say, even, even though I was uh, central to that, because at the time I was um, vice dean of the faculty of social, social sciences in St. Augustine, but Lloyd Bruffett played a critical role. He was very important because at the time he was pro-vice chancellor and principal of St. Augustine. And he facilitated the whole program that came to be a campus, I mean a university-wide program. That was not only St. Augustine but St. Augustine, Cave Hill, and Mona. And Lloyd Braffitt was instrumental in getting that off the ground. So those are the two points I wanted to make. Thanks. Okay. Do you want a response? But it was there a specific? Huh? The list. All right, the list. Was you responsible for the list of, presumably the list of subversives? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was given to special branch to the to the government. All right, anybody wants to answer? No, no, no. Nobody, nobody <laughs> wants to answer. I don't know if the current vice chancellor, who is a historian, will be able to delve into that and give us an answer at a future date. All right, the generous fixer of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> It's on the mic, D.K. Duncan. <coughs> Thank you very much, D.K. Okay. Duncan, yes. dental surgeon. <laughs> <coughs> I don't, I'm a politician. I have no, no information about the list, <laughs> neither the pamphlet. What I do know, which is we will tell you, is that there were a number of organizations in rural Jamaica to which, which Rodney visited. I'd only found the time during the course of uh, January to October, but I know he visited Brownstone at least two times. And what was very striking about those visits was the, as Bonnie says, the, the, the ease with which he was able to capture the, the attention of the people with whom he spoke, mostly on the corners in Brownstone, and the way that they received from him some of the more, what appeared complex of the time, the nature of the African history that he was teaching 
at the university here, and he brought it to those people in that way. They are the only other academic who I saw with that similar kind of approach was G. Beck, mm -hmm. who was a member of the same New World group of which you spoke, a very, very, very important group as far as I was concerned in that period, because apart from the, the groundings and the thing that you'd get or whether you, you're going to a 12 tribe meeting and you, you can't manage to split what you are, are the, are the, are the chidom, and you have to sit down and just watch it, right? Was the, the to see the, the growing consciousness of the Caribbean intellectuals in relation to seeking out new ways for the Caribbean to proceed. And that New World Group did, uh, was really the, the, the instrument, I've, to my mind, or one of, that was able to, 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 to link the, 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 the inter intellectual class at the university with the, those, of, those of us in the, in the rural areas. I know you couldn't do everything tonight, but it, at another stage, I suppose, later this week, some of the spoke about it, they might, get, might be able to go into some of the speakers, might be able to go into how the Abeng newspaper arose all right, following the, 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 the Walter Rodney ban, although that was not the only reason why it came about. But that newspaper is a story of, in and of itself and should be told with all the various linkages to the various mm -hmm. persons. The, um, the other linkages that we could speak about but I do like Jerry says, just think about it, but that we have with us some persons who in the post October 16 Jamaica period, after Rodney went back to Ghana and the problems there leading to his assassination and, now, and that brilliant group of lawyers who had to go to Ghana and carry the torch for those people in the Caribbean who felt that Walter Rodney had contributed significantly. I think one of those was Jackie, uh, Jackie. Yeah. Richard, Richard Small was one of those lawyers. And I think that has come to a, a successful end. All right. Just the last, last, last thing I'd like to, to mention is that in, that, in the period leading up to the October 16th, 1968, as I said, there were a number of, apart from those groups in the corporate area, there are a number of other groups rurally. There was, just you remember, a youth named Jake Degea in Santa Cruz, yeah. taught at the, I think, St. Lisbeth Tech or one of those tools on there. As, as Degea. Degea, yeah. Degea, yes. And, and um, as Jerry said, we had Barry Myers yes. down in, in Westmoreland. And when the, eventually when the Abeng newspaper was printed, it was the, the, the voluntarism yeah. that, was this, that was seen across the island with the networks of distribution of people who would come into Kingston yeah. and, be, and within a few hours, the newspaper would be distributed island wide. That would be something to, for the, when the compilation of the history, we could add some more. Oh, you are the man, right? <laughs> and, um, that you said was the last one, though. Eh? You said that that was the last point. <laughs> yes, okay. Like Jerry, I will stop now. <laughs> no, Jerry, it's not your, no, Jerry, it's not your turn. Jerry, Jerry. Jerry. And they did not lift the ban. The PNB let them hear secretly and didn't lift the ban. Would you tell us why they covered it? 
No, don't I'm going to Jerry. research it. I'm going to research Jerry's it. Jerry's question is not in taking on the board. It's out of order. Go ahead. As yeah. in out of the order of the questioning. Yes. Um, Mark Figueroa. Yes, I'm Mark Figueroa. I'm currently an honorary research fellow at the UWI Museum, which was mentioned by W. Richard Jacobs. And he asked the question about the list, which has 12 names on it. Um, in relation to the black power movement, which in a sense Rupert referred to. Uh, maybe it's a different list because he <laughs> said 10 names and Rupert included his name, which is not on our list. Um, but the point is, I, 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 I can, we can discuss where I got the list and so forth and so on with Richard. Um, and. Uh, I didn't understand, he asked me for the list, but now I understand why he wants the list, because he wants to understand whether the list was, you know, something that was handed over to the police or something like that, since his name is on the list. But the, the point I want to get to is that this has been a wonderful experience because we are getting people to tell their stories, right? And that is really my commitment in retirement and the commitment of the museum. We want people to tell their stories. And we have interviewed Rupert, we have interviewed Richard, we have interviewed Arnold, we have interviewed Bonnie and so forth. But the point is, the museum is going to have an mu exhibition running from the 19th, which is going to go all the way back to March. So what I want everybody to do is come to the museum who have a story and let us, let us record their stories. Let's get those stories. And I have a little difference of opinion with Rupi, because Rupi says certain stories can't be told, right? Right now. Right now. <laughs> well, if you don't tell those stories now, in a few years' time, those stories are gone. Not so, if you have a wife who has made a commitment to well, tell Well, yeah, story. but we know it go. But the point is, we are willing to record the stories, and for however long you want us to keep them locked in the archives, they'll be locked. But for example, um, Michael Burke asked a question that he's been asking for a long time. 50 years. <laughs> which, I, which I could answer, but to answer I would have to reveal a source, which, ha which is confidential, which I cannot answer. But there are people who can answer the question, and I'm appealing to them to answer the question. And after 50 years, I do not believe we have to be fearful of self-incrimination, unless you think we need to call for a truth and reconciliation Perhaps. committee, Rodney Truth and Reconciliation Perhaps. Committee. I don't think anything was that bad, but anyway, we're at the museum, we're waiting for your stories. There are a lot of people in this room with a lot of stories. Do not go to the grave with your stories. Future generations need to know your stories. And of course, Rodney is just to start a bang. The Workers' Party of Jamaica, the PNP, the, the JLP. I don't know if you saw the Netflix. Netflix has a... Uh, um, a, a series that it's brought off. It's called Remastered. It's about politics and music. And the first item was who shot the sheriff, <laughs> right? They came here and they have done a bit of investigative journalism and they have, they have given us their idea of who shot Bob Marley. These stories Marley need to be sheriff. told. Yeah, but you know, they, the foreign people not get it right. You know, it got, <laughs> But I think they got it right as to who shot Bob Marley. <laughs> okay. Can you introduce yourself, please? Well, <clears throat> my name is Keith Miller. I think I've heard a few references to my name. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the organizers on a very brilliant move. I would just want to ask them to do... I would just like to ask them or appropriate persons to go a step further 
and not just allow this to be a sort of one event where people came and expressed themselves. I think there needs to be a much more substantial look and recording and analysis of that. I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know that there has been such an undertaking. And I think it, it is important to the history of Jamaica to put those things in a well-researched and organized way. Okay. Um, I, I would, you know, as I said, I heard persons make mention of my name in a number of respects, and I just want to, um, one of the things I think we should look at in any such investigation is not just the event itself, what took place in October 1968, but what can we see as consequences that flew from that, both nationally and for the university? There were very substantial consequences. As a result, and probably coming out of that, the following year, when I, I was elected on the Guild of Undergraduates as first vice president, and we had some very substantial engagements with the university administration, which has had substantial implications for how this university has been run. First of all, we had a closing of the university when we protested at the beginning of the new academic year. And it had to do with some issues that I hear reference here tonight. One of the things we confronted the university about was their complicity with the government in selectively banning people without being banned. There was a case in which they had gone through the process of advertising for a lecturer and you know that, that process and somebody was selected only for them afterwards not to follow through and it turned out that in point of fact they were doing that because the government had said that that person was not welcome in Jamaica and the Guild of Undergraduates took the stand that the university was not in the business of determining political suitability of people. That was the government's business. And they must appoint people based on their academic qualifications and suitability. That was one of the issues. There were some other issues such as the fact that they were showing some very discriminatory thing. They were refusing to appoint somebody or promote somebody as senior regis assistant registrar on the basis of politics when in point of fact, one of the outgoing registrars was very much a political figure. So, and, and that led to some very serious things. The second big confrontation with the university was regarding the Creative Arts Center. And that, again, I think had substantial implications. In point of fact, when it came home to me, because the, 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 the center was being regarded as a sort of whiting, a privileged place where Noel Vaz sit determined that it was not open and accessible by the student body. And therefore, n nobody could dare to soil the, the thing. And it was locked. And we, we, we went to them. It was a long drawn out thing. But when, it, when, when the significance of it came home to me personally, was I remember a few years ago when my son was launching two of his books at the Creative Arts Center and he was relating to me afterwards that when during his sojourn at the university here, which was not a very distinguished one, <laughs> and people know him, he left without a degree and as a result I think he's one of the few persons who have a master's who don't, doesn't have an undergraduate degree. But the fact is that he was telling me that when he was here, because of his personal things, it was the Creative Arts Center that had really rescued him, that he found as the sort of oasis where he was able to find some significance. So 
both the fact of the, the change, substantial change in how the university operates and many of the structures that now exist about student representation on various committees. We came up, for instance, with the thing about equal number of, in, in, in the creative arts, in solving it, equal numbers of things nominated by the guild and nominated by the administration and a mutually agreeable um, okay. chair. So that, I think, has drifted down now to a lot of the ways in which university is administered and how students have gained significant power and influence on the guild. So I think that period needs to be researched to really bring out a lot of that and to document it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're raising an important point about the funding of the university and the way in which governments who pay the piper, you know, call the tune. Yes. Yes. Um, Swithin Wilmot, I just want to come back to the issue raised, I think, by Jerry. And All right, we're getting close to the end now, so if we could just stay yes, together with yes, respect, Swithin. I'll be very brief. No, no. No, no. I, All I right. Just yes, ask yes. The to be um, quiet. Scree, I think, was very much at the meeting in the assembly hall about three or four days after Michael Manley won in 1972. It was one of his first real popular public appearances when he came on the student body. I mean, it was the second coming and happened, okay? But it struck me that evening, listening to the audience as a student, uh, what, part of what he did was appealing to university academics who had made their names in various fields to come to join the effort. And it's tr he went through a whole list of names of people. How could I do so and so without Norman in Bauxite? How could I do so, -so without George in ag agriculture and so on? But it struck me that evening as he went on and went on, and I'm not going to call the name, but there's a name he didn't call. And by coincidence, the next morning, at a nine o'clock to tour with that person, a group of us went to the tour and said, but they didn't call your name. <laughs> He says, they have made their approaches, but I've set my condition. Until that condition is met, I will not work with them. And the condition was to lift the ban of Walter Rodney, which was never lifted fully, lifted partially in 76, but never really lifted fully. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it seems as if we have now run out of questions. And since it's not yet, wait, Jerry, wait now, man. I was just going to say that since we don't have any more questions and we have a few minutes, I would give you the opportunity to say something more, to get something. No? No. All right, Jerry. You have been vetoed by my audience. So let me therefore now invite Dr. Laura Jan Obermuller, a lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, to give her vote of thanks. I have sat on a little oil drum, rusty and in the midst of garbage. And some black brothers and I have grounded together. Unlike Walter Anthony Rodney, ladies and gentlemen, we are sitting in somewhat comfortable chairs and using speakers and microphone to reflect on issues that was passionate to him at the time when he was declared persona non grata to Jamaica. I would like to thank you all for attending the gathering here and making this event a huge success. While the presentations tonight were enlightening for some of us, it is also an emotional moment for some of our brothers and sisters. Here, leading up to the Rodney Rice, as we know, our panelists have amply described their experiences, and I wish to thank you on behalf of all of us, the organizers, and our guests tonight. 
Our event would not have been possible without the financial assistance of the Center of Reparation Research. And here I do apologize on behalf of the printers where the center is not listed on your program, but the center was quite instrumental in providing financial support. I also wish to thank the Department of Government. Some of us here are aware that finances is quite difficult to secure on campus, so I would like to thank both departments for their support. Most importantly, I would like to thank the members of the organizing committee for planning this event. Dr. Michael Barnett, I must single you out for your dedication in making this event a success. I recall getting 20 phone calls from you on Friday. It's the most you've ever called me since I've been in Jamaica. My special thanks for the poetry readers. I see most of them have left by now. The greetings from my colleagues from the university, from my fellow Guyanese, Indira Prasad and Joannison Hopkinson. I would also like to thank the head of the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work, Dr. Orville Taylor, who understood the significance of tonight's event and had given us his blessing from the time we start organizing this event. While I cannot thank you enough for being part of this event, I would also like to ask you to conceptualize and analyze the reflection shared with us tonight. I would like to encourage you to read the published works of Walter Rodney, Professor Lupert Lewis, Professor Clinton Hutton and others and join the fight towards the eradication of injustices across our region. Thank you and good night.